Okay, I will kickstart the seminar today by introducing our speaker uh, of uh, <laughs> I, oh, I, I know Graciela, so I have too, too many things to talk about, and she is uh, a wonderful, wonderful person. So, okay, cool. Let me do a formal introduction of Professor Graciela Franjuadi Remo. Uh, she's a professor of space astronomy at UCL, the last space science laboratory. She's an X ray astronomer. After a degree in physics at uh, the University of Milano in Italy and a PhD in X ray astronomy at UCL, uh, she worked at the CFA uh, in America before moving to MSSL. She has more than 40 year experience in multi wavelength astrophysics. And also she uh, was the co-eye of the X-ray uh, XMM Newton mission with the reflecting grating spectrometer. She's now a co-eye, uh, co-principal investigator for the SMILE mission. And today we are very, very honored to have her speaking to us about the SMILE mission. Thank you so much, Graciela, and over to you. Thank you very much for this uh, great introduction. Um, let me share my screen and make it uh, full. Okay, I hope uh, this is, uh, you can see this and you can hear me. Yes, yes. Oh, All great. right. So thank you so much for uh, inviting me to talk about uh, the SMILE mission. Um, SMILE stands for Solar Wind Magnetosphere Ionosphere Link Explorer. And it actually is going to do what the name says. Um, SMILE offers a, a new and global way to explore the connections between the sun and the earth. It's a joint mission between the European Space Agency and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And so that's why there are two co-principal investigators, one in China and one in Europe. And uh, it is uh, a collaboration, a joint mission uh, of the two agencies uh, from start to finish, from the time we proposed uh, uh, the mission to when we will be operating it in space. Um, it's under development and uh, is going to be launched uh, at the end of 2024. Now, there are many scientists and engineers from institutions and countries over the world, as you can see there, that make up the SMILE collaboration. Now, I'll give you an introduction to what SMILE science will be about. SMILE is really a scientific mission that will study the dynamic response of the Earth's magnetosphere to the impact to the buffeting of the solar wind in a way that is global and has never been tried before, really. So imagine that a CME, a coronal mass ejection, um, so a great amount of mass and magnetic field is coming out of the sun, travels through the interplanetary space, uh, arrives uh, at the Earth magnetic field, uh, compresses it, uh, and for uh, favorable conditions of the orientation of the magnetic field of the solar wind and the Earth, uh, we have magnetic reconnection taking place on the day side. And this is followed by penetration of uh, particles from the solar wind into the geospace. And uh, we now know that uh, soft X-rays are produced uh, in this uh, pink region, uh, which is the magneto sheath, uh, as well as uh, in the cusps, in the uh, magnetic cusps. And that is due to the uh, phenomenon, to the mechanism of uh, charge exchange, solar wind charge exchange. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. Now, the particles that come into this uh, um, magnetic field, into the magnetosphere, they will uh, diffuse, propagate towards uh, the uh, night side. And uh, there, the uh, magnetic field, again, will undergo magnetic reconnection, given the right uh, conditions, and the particles will be energized to come back and eventually precipitate down 
on the poles of the earth. And that's where uh, the final fate of these particles is to produce the aurora. So uh, this is the kind of uh, process uh, um, uh, that we want a geomagnetic uh, cycle that we want to study with, uh, with SMILE. And so SMILE will carry, first of all, a soft X-ray imager that will look uh, continuously at this uh, emission and study how that varies, uh, especially how the position of the magnetopoles varies under the different conditions of solar wind to try and understand how this process of interaction really uh, works. At the same time, SMILE carries a UV imager that will continuously monitor uh, the northern aurora. And as, as well as these imagers, uh, SMILE also carries uh, um, a package of instruments that will make uh, measurements in situ uh, of the particle composition, as well as the magnetic field characteristics, both in the solar wind when it's out of the magnetosphere, as well as in the magnetosheets. And SMILE will do all of this from this uh, very elliptical orbit, uh, which takes it out to some 19 Earth radii above the Northern Pole. So that's a quick introduction to the mission itself. But now what are really the, the scientific motivations for SMILE? Well, in practice, we want to study the full chain of events that drive this relationship between the solar wind and, and the Earth. And uh, we know that uh, essentially the structure, the dynamics of the magnetosphere are controlled by the phenomenon of magnetic reconnection. And, uh, and you can see some of the circulation that I'm talking about, the magnetospheric circulation. The theory of this is quite well known because uh, we have uh, um, had a lot of measurements uh, in situ by several spacecraft uh, on the micro scale. Uh, however, this, uh, this interaction, and you can see it again, um, how the magnetic field changes with time, how you have a reconnection at the back, and then the particles falling on the aurora, and the aurora becomes brighter. Um, this is a very complex interaction that takes place on, on a global scale. And it evolves with time, as you can see, depending also on the solar wind conditions. So the complexity of all of this is not very well understood. Uh, people have generated lots of uh, models, MHD models, to um, uh, simulate uh, the interaction and predict uh, what can happen, but they still need uh, to be validated by global data. And so SMILE can answer some of the questions that uh, um, will help uh, you know, to understand the different ways in which the interaction takes place, the type of reconnection, magnetic reconnection that we can have, and what really triggers uh, these geomagnetic substorms. So this uh, circulation of particles that eventually then finish uh, on, on to make the aurora at the poles and uh, storms that are driven by coronal mass ejection. So essentially these are all items, these are all questions that um, relate to space weather, which is of course an important aspect of uh, um, that we have to worry about uh, of our relationship with our own sun um, and how it impacts uh, on the technological infrastructure, both uh, on the ground on earth and uh, in space. So I try and illustrate a bit more what kind of scientific motivations uh, I'm talking about. Um, the, the one question is what are the ways uh, fundamentally that uh, this interaction solar wind magnetosphere um, follows. Um, so the, the questions are what kind of reconnection can we expect a steady um, phenomenon or is it transient? bursting or is it just happening on patches around the um, magnetopause or is a global uh, phenomenon? And depends only, does it depend only on solar wind parameters or also on intrinsic instabilities in the um, 
you know, Earth magnetic field. And what's the difference of when it happens uh, at the equatorial level and when it happens instead at high latitude? These are two uh, worlds that represent uh, a component and anti-parallel uh, that represents the two locations where it can happen. And uh, what is the role of the cusps, uh, the magnetospheric cusps uh, in this coupling of solar wind and magnetosphere? And here there are uh, some data that were collected by three of the cluster uh, uh, spacecraft uh, that crossed uh, the cusps. Uh, the first two at the top uh, during a time well, when the interplanetary magnetic field, uh, the IMF, uh, was uh, southwards, uh, was pointing south. That means uh, opposite to the direction of that of the Earth. And uh, the third panel down here, when the IMF was northward instead, and in practice, these are spectrograms. So you have spectra um, energy in the uh, vertical axis and latitude uh, in practice uh, um, on the horizontal axis. And so what we see from uh, these spectrograms is that the ion energy seems to decrease uh, towards the pole when the IMF uh, is southward. And uh, this is contrary to what happens when IMF is northward, where in practice uh, the energy stays the same or tends to increase towards the pole. And also when IMF uh, is towards northward, uh, we, know, we see that the cusp actually, this bright emission, uh, um, propagates uh, through um, higher up uh, towards the pole. So these are the kind of things uh, that we intend to study more in detail. This is just a snapshot that was obtained when three of the spacecraft or cluster happened to cross the cusp. But with SMILE, we can observe that uh, for long times continuously. And another thing is the study of the Aurora with the, especially the UVI, the UV images. So in practice, the question is what really determines the cycle of substorms of these particles going to the night side and coming back and creating the aurora. Um, what, uh, uh, what kind of conditions, magnetospheric conditions, does the aurora lower respond to? The IMF orientation or also uh, dynamic pressure? What you see here are images taken from the image um, spacecraft that flew some 10 years, 10, 15 years ago. And you have two examples of the auroral oval uh, during a period of a uh, high um, sort of enhanced uh, solar wind and a period when it was quieter. And this, this plot over here shows the radius of the oval and you see it's larger at these times and then goes down and then increases again. So the auroral oval really keeps uh, changing and this on over a period of about 10 days. And what you see down here in the other two plots are data that represents the activity in the magnetic field of the Earth. This is a particular index uh, uh, indicating the magnetic field. And you see when there is uh, enhanced uh, um, variability essentially in the magnetic field, you have uh, the aurora reacts to that. And also this is um, a plot of the transpolar uh, uh, potentials. Uh, and again, they respond to the activity of the wind. And uh, you see that in correspondence again to this time, you have a very active aurora and vice versa, quieter time when the uh, solar wind is not very active. And then there are other aspects of magnetospheric behavior that it will be interesting to study with, uh, uh, with SMILE. There are particular um, geomagnetic storms that look like uh, so too, so events that keep showing increase and decrease of uh, activity. And auroral beads as well, some very peculiar, really like little blobs that you see forming around uh, the oval. And are all things that we want to try to investigate longer, especially because uh, UVI and SMILE will give us a very long observation times. Having a very elliptical orbit, you will spend a long time near apogee and so we'll observe down to the, um, to the 
polar oval and to the magneto sheets for very long periods of time, up to 40 hours. Um, so then the other question is how do uh, CME storms, driven storms, uh, come up and how do they relate to substorms that are more generated uh, by um, changes, shocks in the solar wind? The CME driven storms are due to these great mass amounts that are propagating off the sun. And so what's the difference between the two? And CME driven storms generally correspond to periods of very fast solar wind and long times when the IMF is southward. Um, and so the question is, uh, um, is the solar wind that drives them or what else could it be done? Could do it. And what's the relation with substorms? How do they end? These are all questions that have relevance to space weather. So this is one aspect of SMILE that we can claim that is very useful to tell us about the science of space weather and how we can understand it better in order to mitigate the effects at some point. Okay, so that's about the, the science of SMILE, but now I turn to my old astrophysics uh, to pick up the, the reason um, of why SMILE is so novel and where does the idea of SMILE come from? And in practice, I talk about solar wind charge exchange, this process. And uh, this process uh, in practice is represented in this cartoon. Um, occurs when you have a um, very highly ionized ion of the solar wind, say like uh, an oxygen seven plus, which uh, comes into the exosphere of the earth. So it comes into the magneto sheath, encounters a atom of hydrogen and uh, exchange a charge or acquires uh, an electron from the hydrogen and is left in an excited state. And then from that, it decays, it de-excites with the emission of a photon, an X-ray photon. And the photon is in the band of the soft X-rays, about half of a kV. And this equation down here represents the, um, the power, the emissivity of this process, which is proportional to the density of the solar wind particles, ions, the density of the neutrals uh, in the magneto sheet and the relative velocity of the particles plus uh, a constant multiplied by a constant represents all the atomic physics, uh, the cross sections uh, and all of these quantities. And this is a process, uh, a charge exchange is interesting that was known since the dawn of atomic physics, but was also only recognized uh, about 20, 25 years ago in the context of astrophysics. Um, and so the X-ray emission is proportional to the density of the solar wind ions, as I said, and the neutrals. And so it's brightest uh, in the Earth's uh, day side magneto sheet and uh, the cusps. So how did we get uh, to, um, first of all, understand that there is solar wind charge exchange uh, in uh, around us in, in general in the universe and also very near our own earth. Well, charge exchange uh, comes, uh, goes back to the times of the first observation of a comet that was made with the Rosat spacecraft back in 1996. And for some time, the comet uh, uh, appeared uh, uh, extremely bright in soft X-rays. And for some time, people could not explain why this comet would be such bright X-ray sources until um, essentially Tom Cravens suggested that uh, uh, this may well be due to solar wind charge exchange because the comets have got a very extended neutral coma and the solar wind interacting with it, doing uh, charge exchange with it would produce all these soft X-rays, and that was indeed the case. Um, and there are other examples of uh, that brought uh, this charge exchange closer to, to Earth. If you look uh, again, is an observation made with Rosat of the Moon, 
uh, in X-rays and you see the illuminated side of the moon that reflects uh, the solar X-rays, just like it reflects uh, light and visible light. But then there is the dark side of the moon and you would expect uh, that that would uh, occult uh, this other diffuse emission, which is the diffuse X-ray background, would occult it completely. And instead, if you look carefully, there are some residual X-rays, which again was hard to explain until one realized that we are seeing the moon through the magneto sheet. And so these X-rays that we see and that are variable with the solar wind variability are nothing else than solar wind charge exchange. And again, then there were several observations with Chandra, with Suzaku, especially when he was looking at the North uh, Ecliptic Pole, uh, was looking out uh, through the cusp. Uh, and all those observations were affected by uh, low energy, soft X-rays, uh, background variability. And that variability just matched uh, the variability of the solar wind. And again, with the new XMM Newton, Jenny Carter did a very extended study of uh, times when uh, um, soft X-ray variable background was observed and it was uh, definitely related, correlated with the variability of the solar wind. So how did we get from there to SMILE? Well, um, in essentially to start with, uh, these X-rays from the magnetosphere were considered an unwanted background, a noise, a nuisance for uh, X-ray astronomers looking out uh, to the cosmos. But then uh, some people, and then including me, thought, uh, well, maybe we can use them as uh, an imaging diagnostic tool uh, of the Earth interaction with the solar wind. And so there were uh, early concept missions in which uh, I wasn't originally involved in. Um, there were first uh, proposals to NASA as uh, MAGEX uh, and STORM. Um, and then uh, um, I got involved in it and we proposed to ESA two missions, Axiom and Axiom C for uh, in response to different calls for uh, ideas for missions that was in 2010, 2012. But that was a bit too early for uh, um, the different communities, especially of uh, uh, space physicists and astrophysicists to realize that this could actually be done, <laughs> that it was a good idea to study, you know, space physics through a, a technique used, used in astrophysics. And the first time that actually um, it, an attempt of measuring this uh, um, magnetospheric X-rays was done was with the rocket flights, um, two rocket flights uh, up to 2015 or so. And uh, all of these missions and uh, the, the instruments in the rocket flights um, are essentially based on the technique of using lobster eye optic that I'll describe in a moment, because they give you a very large field of view for X-ray um, measurements. And so over the years, the, this concept matured quite substantially. And uh, so we proposed the SMILE in response to a call by ESA and CAS um, for uh, joint missions. And we um, responded to that and uh, SMILE was successful, was chosen in June 2015 for this joint ESA-CAS mission. And then was selected for implementation by ESA in uh, the November of 2015 and adopted by ESA, this is the formal jargon of the European Space Agency, it was adopted in the Cosmic Vision Program in 2019, which means is now in the program and is going to be implemented. And the launch is expected, as I said, at the end of 24. Um, just uh, one uh, smile, uh, one slide to say that uh, the, this idea of uh, measuring um, um, the magnetosphere condition uh, in X-rays, uh, it's actually now become very popular. And these, uh, there are a number of missions uh, that uh, are going to um, do 
you know, uh, what SMILE is attempting to do and do it better because they will be, you know, we will have learned more and they have more resources than, than SMILE. So the missions that are currently under development and also under study are, first of all, there is CUPID. This is a CubeSat mission, actually, that is going to look up at the CASPs from underneath. And it was launched last September. And then there is LEXI. Um, and this is uh, essentially a similar imager, X-ray imager that would be, will be deployed on the moon. It's already been building. Built up. Um, and it will go with the first uh, lander on the moon uh, within the Artemis program of NASA. And then there is a proposal uh, of STORM by David Seibeck. And uh, this is uh, in practice like a Mark II smile, a, a mission with uh, more uh, imagers, with more instruments on board. And um, it will be part, is a, an explorer um, kind of uh, mission within the Helios uh, Physics uh, um, Department of NASA and is in the study phase with good prospect of being implemented. And then uh, we proposed um, follow on ideas as a uh, white paper for uh, the Voyage 2050 uh, program of visa, where we would be exploring again the solar terrestrial interactions using multiple observers. This would be a, a mission with two spacecraft that would observe uh, around the Earth in a way that we can see the CASPs simultaneously, because that would be very interesting to understand what happens in the two hemispheres of the Earth. And then another idea that we proposed for the ESA lander for the Moon is try and monitor uh, geospace from the moon. Again, a sort of enhanced uh, imager. And then there are developments in Japan to have GeoX, uh, again, a similar uh, to SMILE mission to look at the magneto sheet. And in China, they are developing a lander for the moon as well. So you see, SMILE is really creating some, uh, some follow on. That's good. And now I've got a few slides uh, to describe to you the ins and outs uh, of, uh, of the instruments uh, and of the mission. Um, so first of all, about uh, the soft X-ray imager, the SXI. And I have to start by saying that the way um, you, you probably know already, but uh, X-rays can only be focused uh, if you reflect them at grazing incidence so that they can be brought uh, to a single point. And uh, um, in order to have uh, a very large uh, field of view, this technique of lobster eye micropore optic uh, has been developed, where you have in practice uh, this kind of uh, curved uh, um, structure made up of lots and lots and lots of uh, micro, micro pore, uh, micro channels really, and in each of them, uh, the X-ray get uh, reflected, a grazing incidence. And in this way, you can have a large field of view with a very compact camera. The, the focal length is pretty, uh, is pretty short. And the optics uh, are represented by these uh, sort of large uh, structures uh, in which uh, all of these micro, you know, minute pores uh, focus, uh, reflect, and then focus the X-rays. Um, so this is the compact camera that uh, um, is incorporated in SXI. So the camera is represented by this beige um, structure here. Um, there is a, a large baffle on top of it to avoid contamination from stray light from the sun and the bright earth. And the detectors at the focal plane are two large format CCDs, charge coupled devices. And this gray green type of structure is a um, radiation shutter that is a, practically a door that closes on top of the detectors every time we come into the radiation belts to protect the silicon detectors from uh, um, problems uh, due to radiation, contamination due to radiation. The CCDs are photon counting. So we get uh, uh, for each photon that gets detected, 
we have the position X and Y, and we have an energy as well, apart from the time in which they are collected. So not only we will get uh, images like you see here, um, where we will see bright uh, the um, structure of the magnetopause and the cusps, but also we'll get spectra. Um, so we have counts versus energy, and uh, the charge exchange spectrum is essentially just the overposition of many, many emission lines. And we'll be able with the resolution of the CCDs to recognize at least the strongest one. And it will be giving us a measure of the composition of the solar wind, essentially. And the PI for uh, SXI is Stevenson Bay from the University of Leicester in the UK. Um, and MSSL is involved, my laboratory is involved in the production of the front end electronics for, for this instrument. Now, I have a few images of uh, uh, parts of, uh, the, um, of the instruments. So here we see the um, primary structure, the tube that contains, uh, that supports uh, the micropore optic, uh, and underneath it is the um, focal plane. And uh, you see here the structural thermal model. Every time we build uh, a instruments for a space mission, we make uh, several different models uh, because we have to test them uh, first in order to make sure that they will work uh, once they are in space. And the structural thermal model is to test uh, in practice the structural strength uh, and uh, the ability of the instrument to withstand uh, the launch uh, stresses in practice. So this is uh, in practice the, the main structure of the telescope. And over here we see one of the um, large frame CCDs that is mounted in a test camera at the Open University. It is another collaborator in this uh, um, in these instruments uh, for SMILE. And here, in fact, there are all uh, the other uh, contributors, all the other countries that contribute, uh, um, because nowadays is practically, well, it's very difficult to uh, be supported financially uh, fully by one single country to make uh, these complex uh, instruments. Now, um, this is an image of uh, the structural thermal model of the whole uh, of the SXI telescope uh, mounted on the vibration table where uh, it was tested back in April at the Rutherford Appleton lab in, in the UK. Now, there is actually an interesting movie at this uh, um, link, uh, which I'll put in the chat later on, because it's good to see it, but I, I don't uh, offer it on through Zoom because uh, I tried it before and it doesn't reproduce the real, you know, frightening effects of how the instruments is really vibrated strongly on the table. So I'll, uh, I'll give you this, uh, this link unless you have been able to copy it straight away, but I'll, I'll put it in the, um, chat uh, um, link before uh, afterwards uh, and it is quite interesting to see and it also makes quite some noise anyway once uh, after that test uh, and uh, after integrating everything of the instrument uh, with also its um, um, its uh, thermal uh, blanket and so on this is uh, you you can see the uh, size of the instruments uh, with respect uh, to uh, humans, uh, and this was in the lab at Leicester, just before it was uh, packed uh, to be put in this container and uh, shipped uh, to uh, Spain, uh, to Airbus, uh, where then it was integrated uh, with the payload uh, module. And here is a picture of the front-end electronics that we are developing and testing at uh, MSSL. And this is once uh, the uh, SXI arrived uh, in, uh, in Spain at Airbus and has been integrated, mounted and fixed on this plate, essentially is a um, interface plate, which we call the payload module. And what is what interfaces uh, the imagers uh, to the rest of uh, the spacecraft, uh, to the platform. And near the 
SXI, you also see the structural model of the UVI, the, of the UV imager. Now, here we have uh, a simulation of uh, the X-ray emissivity that uh, you could have expected uh, to see with the smile during a particular strong storm in 2015. These are the actual solar wind parameters. And our collaborator, Tian Ran San, has created this uh, uh, emissivity map of the X-rays that would be uh, pro produced uh, as uh, the storm developed. This covers some 15 hours or so, but uh, in, and is done in 20 seconds. So of course it's accelerated, but it gives you an idea of uh, how the kind of variability that we can expect once we take images with uh, SXI. And how do we turn, like, that could be a question, how do we turn these X-ray emissivity um, predictions uh, to actually observe the counts or uh, predicted counts from the SXI? Well, uh, what we do, essentially the MHD uh, simulations uh, provide us uh, with like uh, uh, a 3D cube of uh, uh, emissivity once we multiply by the uh, density of the uh, particles in the solar wind with the model of the exospheric neutrals. So we get a, a, in practice a 3D cube of X-ray emissivity, and then we integrate this cube along the line of sight from SMILE from whatever position in its orbit. And so we can produce 2D maps of the emissivity. These are then passed through a code that simulates the performance of SXI, and we get these images, which are pixelated, of course, because the CCDs give us um, photon uh, positions, uh, and we um, bin them up into this map. But those are the images that then we will be analyzing to measure how the position of the magnetopause changes with time, the cusps, uh, and so on. Now I turn to the UVI. I have a, one slide on the UVI and one on the, um, on the in situ package of instruments. So this is the U, um, ultraviolet imager, which is, and you see a, a, an idea of the structure of the instrument here. And uh, is a four mirror reflective telescope, uh, um, which looks uh, at the complete uh, northern aurora oval throughout uh, the flight uh, of, uh, um, of SMILE when he is in towards the north hemisphere. And he provides images of it uh, with high spatial and temporal resolution. The band pass is pretty narrow um, in the UV and is achieved by coating both the optical and detec detector surfaces with uh, appropriate materials because we want to exclude uh, as far as possible, any contamination from visual uh, daylight. And the image intensifier is used as uh, a detector. And uh, this is uh, a collaboration between China, Canada, and Belgium. And you see here some examples of the optics module, breadboard, and the electronics for the, uh, for the instrument. The PI is from the National um, Space Center, Cent, uh, National Center for Space Weather in China. Um, these are uh, images uh, that were taken by the spacecraft called IMAGE uh, some years ago, but I show them to just give you an, an idea of the kind of images that we can expect uh, to derive uh, from uh, UVI, remembering that it will be at most of the time looking into the uh, daylight. So that's why it's got to be selecting very particular narrow UV uh, regions uh, of the band pass. And there are specific also modeling done of the aurora as it will be seen um, through the UVI uh, using an end-to-end -end simulator that has been developed already. 
And then we have the in situ instruments, uh, um, which are responsibility of China. The light ion analyzer it, uh, is a top hat analyzer for protons and alpha particles. We'll measure density, velocity, temperature, um, and it works in an energy range that is applicable to both the magneto sheets and, and the solar wind, uh, depending on where SMILE is. And there are two sensors, uh, and you have uh, uh, the image of the an, an engineering model of the LIA here. And there are two of these sensors mounted on the platform of uh, SMILE. And then we have a magnetometer uh, of the flux gate um, that measures magnetic field strength and direction is uh, comprising two sensors that are mounted on a very long boom, uh, three meters long, and that will be deployed once we are in space. So here you see an image of a test that has been done on the ground for deploying the, um, the boom. Um, here you see an image of SMILE in its launch configuration with the, um, with the solar panel folded in, and uh, it shows also the different uh, contributions uh, of uh, the two agencies. ESA provides uh, the payload module. So as I said, there is this uh, plate uh, on which uh, both the imagers are mounted, provides the launcher, the assembly integration and test facilities for the integration of the whole spacecraft uh, in uh, Holland, and uh, the ESA member states and Canada provide instruments. CAS, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, pro provides the propulsion module, these four tanks mounted at, underneath the platform that will propel the spacecraft up to its final very elliptical orbit. Uh, the service module, this boxy structure with all the infrastructure that is needed to run the spacecraft, the spacecraft prime contractors, mission operations with some contribution by ESA, and the Chinese uh, instruments. Here we see some pictures of that uh, uh, spacecraft platform, the, uh, propel, the, the propulsion module and the service module with the, um, uh, the solar panels folded in during tests uh, in China, uh, mass property tests. So for instance, measuring the center of mass of the spacecraft, a vibration test here, and uh, an acoustic test, all uh, in order to make sure it will work uh, at launch, you know. Yes. Uh, and uh, talking about uh, orbit and launch, uh, the baseline, as I said, is very elliptical. It takes uh, SMILE out uh, to 120,000 kilometers away from the Earth in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the orbit lasts uh, uh, 51 hours as period, of which 40 hours can be used for SXI and UVI science operations when we are well away from the radiation belts. The launch is expected to happen at the end of 24. And there are at the moment two possibilities for launchers. One would be Vega C, a smaller launcher where a SMILE would be a single passenger. And in that way, it would go pretty quickly from a sort of a low Earth orbit, then the propellant will be pushing it up to its final orbit. Or otherwise, it could go on an Ariane 6, and it would be a dual launch. So SMILE would be a, a sort of piggyback uh, uh, passenger. And in that case, it will have to go probably into a sun synchronous orbit, uh, um, because it will go with an Earth observation satellite or so, and that's the typical orbit in which they go. So then it may have to wait uh, in this orbit uh, for some time before it can eventually get uh, to the right position and be propelled up to its final uh, orbit. And the selection of which launcher will be used uh, will be done later this year at the mission critical design review. And there will be ground station in Antarctica and uh, in China. Um, now, uh, I should say that uh, in order to optimize uh, the performance and the output of SMILE, we have uh, lots of working groups uh, 
uh, which welcome, you know, uh, participation by interested uh, scientists and engineers. We have a working group that is looking at the data formats that will uh, uh, that, that will pertain to the data that will re be returned by SMILE. Of course, we are combining imagers and in situ instruments. So there are different types of data that have to be combined related to each other. So that's what the working group is looking at. There is a working group on science operations. The best way to operate uh, um, SMILE are being studied uh, and uh, to maximize its return. An in situ working group uh, studying the best way of uh, operating, calibrating the uh, in situ instruments. A modeling working group, which is very active in uh, um, essentially providing simulations and predictions of what SXI will uh, return in terms of images and how to analyze them, those images to extract uh, uh, optimally information from them. And then there is a group uh, that um, uh, is uh, con trying to establish connections uh, with uh, ground-based uh, facilities because uh, it will certainly add value to SMILE to combine space data with what is measured on the ground and try to really uh, fill up this uh, um, regime of, uh, of possibilities for the um, geomagnetic uh, cycle of uh, particles distribution and falling um, into the aurora. And also additional science that can be added by um, space mission flying at the same time as MILE, and again, correlating data observed in other regions of geospace. And finally, but not, uh, um, you know, the, the main action on this is the outreach working group, which uh, promotes uh, uh, SMILE with the general public and schools and so on. Here is, uh, I, I like to show this image, is the last time we had a consortium meeting in China. Uh, and that was back in May, 2019, for obvious reasons, because uh, we had another consortium meeting in Spain in the autumn. And then since then we have been meeting in um, online. Uh, we generally have a consortium meeting of all the um, instrument teams uh, and scientists and engineers that are interested in the mission uh, every six months. And normally we alternate between China and the West. And uh, unfortunately, as I say, since uh, 2019, we haven't been able to share uh, locations in that way. This is my last slide to sort of summarize the impact that uh, SMILE is expected to, to have. First of all, I want to add this comment that uh, um, as an X-ray astronomer, I find it very um, gratifying that um, we can use uh, the X-rays from the magnetosphere that, as I said, were an unwanted, or still are an unwanted background for X-ray astrophysicists, and we use them as uh, a diagnostic tool of the interaction between the solar wind and the earth. And SMILE is going to be a scientific mission. It's not a, um, an operational mission in the sense of predicting space weather, cannot tell us uh, when uh, really a, a storm is going to come, but it will provide science information on what happens when uh, a storm is generated when the solar wind conditions are particularly active. And uh, all of these data are really needed to validate uh, the, the global models uh, that uh, have been uh, developed uh, of these interactions, solar wind magnetosphere. Outreach, uh, I've already mentioned it, uh, it's, um, it's really got a strong potential uh, um, because uh, um, SMILE is a visual mission. It provides images, movies that can captivate the public to science. And especially it will make visible an entity that of the Earth's magnetic field, which has been invisible so far. And the cooperation with China is another 
interesting aspect of, uh, of this mission, uh, working together, different cultures, different, uh, different and not so different ways of, of doing science and, uh, and engineering. And SMILE is really a showcase uh, and is actually building on, on experience that is already had uh, in the past uh, with uh, Chinese uh, mission of uh, double star. So this is where uh, I think I close uh, my talk uh, and uh, thank you very much for listening and I'm ready to take uh, any questions. <laughs> thank you so much, Graciela. Let's give uh, Graciela a round of applause, a virtual one you should have. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rusty, there's uh, one question in the chat during the talk uh, when you show about the substorm uh, cycle and yeah. it's asked by Sinyu. And Sinyu, if you like, you can feel free to mute yourself or I can help you ask as well. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, shall I go back uh, to where uh, I. Yeah. Uh, Sinyu, oh, actually, I. I think seeing you probably uh, need to go for another meeting, but his question Hello. was- Okay, <laughs> can should you... I uh, go out of the slide or should I stay on the slide? Tell I'll me stay with best. the slide, that would be good. Okay, yeah, I, okay. I think it's when you talk about uh, the substorm cycle, uh, you mentioned about the short tooth mechanism. And yeah. seeing your question was, can you explain the uh, short tooth mechanism a bit? Is it the same <laughs> as the short tooth instability in tokamak? Oh wow! Ah, this uh, this is uh, out, outside my comfort zone. Um, <laughs> this uh, this uh, okay because you see, I said I declared I'm an X-ray astronomer by by birth. <laughs> uh, well, these uh, so tooth. Yes, I saw. Uh, I mentioned them over here. These ones, the so tooth yeah. events. Well, yes. as far as I understand, these are cases where uh, um, the parameters of the solar wind, like uh, I imagine measurements of this type, um, have a profile that is a so tooth profile in the sense that you have a sort of slow increase and then sudden drop. Maybe this one, I, I haven't checked, but maybe this one is one such case where you have really a so tooth profile of the behavior of the solar wind. This is uh, what I have learned, uh, um, but I don't think I can say any further than this. I, I don't know how I could relate this to Tokama. I see, thanks. Uh, sorry, Sinya, I, I noticed you're around, but yeah, feel free to ask any follow-up question and open to the floor for any question as well. Okay. Um, please feel free to raise your hand or use the chat. In the meanwhile, um, Rasiel, I have a question. You mentioned uh, SMILE is looking at the global imaging. So before yeah. SMILE, uh, and I also noticed SMILE is the first mission doing the global imaging in X-ray, but uh, what happened before when people try to study the sun earth? not on global scale, what sort of scale are they looking at? Ah, okay, well, uh, that is, uh, um, when I said uh, about uh, uh, doing things on the micro scale, I said, I think, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, basic theory magnetospheric circulation is well known, all this, what happens here, because uh, we had uh, lots of uh, uh, missions and cluster is one uh, example of four spacecraft that were, uh, or still work, uh, are positions uh, in very different locations uh, with respect to the Earth. And they make uh, measurements, uh, what we call in situ, on location. So okay. in practice, they measure the density of particles, they measure uh, their velocity, their temperature of uh, protons, ions, electrons. And so, but these are snapshots. And uh, you cannot have uh, a, a full view of uh, what really happens uh, in different places at the same time. Already, as I said, uh, I should turn my lights on, otherwise I... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I in the UK. <laughs> because you see, it's late in the day now, and yes, uh, yes. It's, it's all dark. <laughs> I know it happened before <laughs> that I forget uh, that uh, days get uh, darker soon. These days, anyway, 
this is uh, one such example of uh, um, three of the cluster uh, uh, spacecraft uh, that took mm -hmm. measurements uh, in different places. Uh, and this is one of uh, the occasional times when uh, the three measurements actually allow us to draw conclusions uh, um, of what happens in the CASPs, uh, uh, depending on if the IMF is south or northward. But it takes uh, uh, several observations uh, and just happening at the same time in the right place uh, to get uh, to these conclusions. While instead, if we could have seen uh, all of these uh, from uh, a sort of vantage point uh, where we see this happening overall uh, in a larger region, that would help uh, and it would uh, it wouldn't be such a snapshot type of measurement, but it is what we call the global imaging that we intend to do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, are there any other questions? I noticed we're reaching uh, the hour, so some of the people may have to go for the next meeting. Go away. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, but before that, let's give another round of applause to our, our speaker today, okay. Graciela. Thank, thank you so you. much for a wonderful talk. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you, thank you.